Please. Welcome back to the next part of this Truth and Rhythm episode. Be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. Also become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you so much for your interest and support. Enjoy. D did Morris try to be peacemaker then? Not then. Not, not then. Um, but Morris was one of the ones who was catching it the worst. You know, like it, I, mean, I remember um, you have to understand the, the technology was limited at the time. We were I remember the day Morris realized that uh, he was Prince would call a song we hadn't played in like three months and Morris would go to load up his sounds. And they'd be missing. This happened twice and Prince was like, you better work that out. And so <laughs> Morris and his keyboard tech figured out that his drive was full. And every time he put new music in, the computer randomly selected some other music and just shoved it out. <laughs> and the technology had not been built to back it up like that yet. To, to like a, there was no contingency for that yet. So, and I remember the day Morris was trying to explain this to Prince and Prince didn't want to hear it. And I, I know Morris as, as I hung around Morris Hayes so much. I knew if he started rubbing his head, he was getting agitated. He was, the heat was coming. Like he was about to say something maybe he ought to not. Like he says, like, I'm all, I've just about had enough. Like he's trying to ex explain to Prince that this is a manuf manufacturing flaw. This is not me. And that if you let some of these songs go and be more focused in your pursuit, we can make it work. You just need to use a little restraint on your part. And no way Prince is going to, you know, entertain that or even, you know, process it. <laughs> so Morris tried to explain to Prince, and, uh, that, that, I don't care. Uh, you know, he was one of those days. And I saw uh, Prince was standing on the, the, the floor in the sound stage, and we were all up on the stage. And, um, and Prince started kind of hollering, and Morris got up from the organ and was kind of pacing and... I'm like, ooh, okay, all right. I don't know what's going to happen here, but Morris kept his cool, and I'm sure they figured things out. But you know, I I think that um, uh, the stakes were higher, <laughs> and it was a different kind of group. Like Morris, uh, he was not the peacemaker he was later on, because there was so much more to be con to concerned with when it was just us four. He was under the gun just like we were. By the time those other people came along, Morris was a, a senior member. And I'll give him this. He always talked to Prince like he was a, a, uh, just a person. And he said, Prince, you, you, know, you can send me to the house today. And I, I can say that I have I reached the pinnacle, you know, the summit of my musical career. I could, I could, I could go right now, but I got to say this. And then he expressed himself to Prince. And I really respected Morris for doing that. My general take on it was I would, I would absorb a, a, a lot of abuse and then just a moment would come where I just would face him, you know? Um, so it was, it was different. It's like, if I knew I was right and he was being, you know, uh, unduly sarcastic or, or difficult with me, I'd cut to the chase. Cause I always hear my dad's voice in my mind. Like, you don't have to be here. You can quit. You have options. So I always felt like I had a choice. And having a choice calmed my mind and I went, okay, you know, and I just get back to the work. But um, 
I'm just saying the tension was getting high. We weren't getting along. Uh, even in Japan, during that run, we went to Rapungi one night after a, uh, after a show. And they had a 24-hour McDonald's. Like, hey, let's go get some Big Macs or something, man. Let's go, let's go, you know. So we went to Rapungi, and uh, Prince comes walking in <laughs> like about 10 minutes after we got there. You know, uh, you know, but like on, you know, like the the cool run, like on the paparazzi run, you know, with a security in up to the upper level in this McDonald's. And we we're all kind of looking at each other. And I can't remember who he sent down to say, hey, uh, Prince uh, wants to know if you guys want to join him upstairs. And we looked at each other and I... I I think I might have been the one who said, no, that's all right. We're, we're, we're good right here. One of us said it, and nobody equivocated or even blinked. We were, by that time, it was like, man, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not dating you. We don't have to take the abuse, you know? You don't, you don't we don't, uh, you know, you could, I, I mean, we, if you want to box us out, we can do the same thing to you. That's what it was, you know. That's also why my ride or die for life uh, are the other three dudes. You might as well, we might as well be the four stooges. Me, Morris, Sonny, and Tommy, we went through so much together, and it 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 bonded us really for life. Like like you know, soldiers who went to Nam together. <laughs> you know, it's like we we got a life in my in my for me, I got a lifelong commitment, admiration, and respect, and love for all three of those dudes. So, you know, wow. but, but, you know, he was trying to stand up to Warner Brothers, and we were standing up to him. So it's, you know, it just, the, the whole thing, I'm, you know, it kind of, you could see that Prince was feeling, you know, left out and kind of, you know, like, you know, it's like you could just tell, like, he 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 could feel. He could feel it. So, and, what, uh, so what, you left in 95? Uh, 96, March of 96, I believe. Like, right around my birthday. So, that was before Emancipation came out? Yeah, and also, um, right before, uh... Chaos and Disorder? No, before Exodus came out on, uh, like, Edel? Was that the German label? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of that's, I, I think the record came out after we were gone, but I think they had already dropped The Good Life and Get Wild, you know, but I think that the record itself, uh, once once it got, uh, once they found a, a label who was going to take it, then, I mean, what he did do was um, gave us all a, 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 a fair advance. You know, I think he already knew that, like, it's over. And I think that was his way of also just kind of giving us a little something, so he didn't have to feel guilty about the fact that we were now have to go, go having to go out into the world and you know, and, and make a go of it. You know, I really that's how I feel about it. I can't, you know, I can't confirm any of that, but that was my feeling. It was like, okay, and also there was a conversation we had had with him maybe a week before that, where where Paul Dainty. Uh, a promoter in Australia offered Prince like a million dollars a show. And Prince told us in his office, he's like, this whole thing with Warner Brothers, uh, you know, it's like, I'm, I, I don't want to do it. I, you know, he's like, I, I, as a matter of fact, he started saying, you know, it's like, I, it's it, $1 million a show is not enough. I really don't know what I want to do with my future right now. You guys, maybe you should guys start, you should start looking, you know, for some other things to get into while I figure things out. So it was kind of like, like, are we being let go or not? And then like right after that, it was like, oh, Exodus, you know, is, is coming out. Oh, Ironically gonna, titled. Advanced checks? Okay. And then right after that, here comes Therese. With, is it the yellow slip or the pink slip? Which one is means you're fired? Get out of here. Did it hit you though that the Exodus was an ironic title at that point? <laughs> no, it did not. 
but what is it? Is it the pink slip, blue slip? What is it? When you, pink you slip. give, yes, yeah. yeah, right away. We got, we came in. Oh, hey, you guys are being let go. Uh, you know, and it was just you know nonchalant. <laughs> oh, well, all right then. <laughs> you know, <laughs> good day. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, it's like the, the writing was on the wall, man. The tension was too high. He didn't really feel like anybody was in his corner. And we didn't go out of our way to make him feel that way. The, the warm and fuzzy was gone. You know, it's just like, dude, you've just proven to me that you care. I mean, I understand you care more about the well, you, you care about the work, but you don't care about the people who are giving you the work. You know, or at least that's how I felt, you know. And you went out into the uh, big world of music, and you really, you right. know, got some big wins, you know. And well, my um, first stop was with Paul Westerberg, his because I cut with him and Paisley in Studio B in late '95, and his record was coming out on either Warner Brothers or Reprise, or and so he he heard from somebody. He called me up. Heard you got fired. I said, Yeah, Paul. Oh, well, I. My record's coming out. You know, he's smoking the Swisher Sweets. <laughs> Yo, you want to come out with me? Absolutely, man. Would love to. So, you know, I jumped on the next, you know, train and <laughs> began to try to figure this, this navigate this world without, you know, Prince, uh, you know, Prince, being in Prince's uh, golden cage, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> You, you worked with a lot of big name acts. We're not going to get to talk about all of them, but um, one of the ones that's not so big that I do want to ask you about for sure is Jeff Lee Johnson because I was a fan, you know? Who, well, it, to hear him is to become a fan. Yeah. Well, what what do you want to know? <laughs> well, well, what can you tell viewers? Because he's an under-the-radar cat, you know? So um, what can you tell viewers that might make them want to go out and start checking out his music if they don't already know it? And what was he like that, you know, since he's no longer around to tell us? <laughs> wow, man, you really you want the real deal. Okay, brother, let me fix my head for a second. I met Jeff Lee Johnson. Uh, one of the things I did after the Westerberg tour, sorry, was I decided to go to L.A. I'm like, I'm going to Los Angeles and I'm going to stay there until I get a job a real job with a real artist, you know, and a friend of mine uh, had a house, like a guest room I was staying at in uh, Los Feliz. Yeah. And, um, uh, or actually, no, that house was on like Doheny and Wilshire, like kind of where billboards is at, like down the hill from there. Um, and uh, I'm there for two days. And all of a sudden, uh, Shaka Khan's manager calls me. <laughs> Simone calls. Uh, Hi, how you doing, love? Um, apparently, you know, Shaka had been out at Paisley working with Prince uh, at that time. And she said, <laughs> and Morris was there. And uh, she said to Prince, where's that big old drummer you used to have? <laughs> and Prince said, oh, he, he doesn't work for me anymore. And, uh, she said, well, where's he at? And I guess Morris Hayes sl slipped her manager my number and they called my home phone number and got the answer machine would had the number of where I was at in, in LA. So, and she was getting ready to play the Playboy Jazz Festival like the next week. And so they, I'm like, well, I'm here already. So, <laughs> you know, that's literally, you know, how that worked out. Like they called, and I said, yes. And I was in rehearsal with her the next week. And that's where I met Jeff. Jeff was coming in as a, as a substitute for a, a guitar player named Mike Campbell, who was going to Japan to do a run with uh, JT from Cool in the Gang. So, and Shaka had heard a record by Jeff Lee called Blue. And she fell in love with him immediately. And then she also saw him play with D'Angelo. And uh, so Shaka was like all about, what do you hear my guitar player? <laughs> you know, and they were both at the rehearsal and Jeff Lee was just kind of sitting on the couch. He had his guitar, you know, his tuned, and he was kind of funking along while they were playing, you know, not with an amp or anything, just sitting on the couch, 
you know, just this sort of just withdrawn, frail figure, you know, <laughs> on the couch, just didn't say nothing to nobody, just moving his fingers. And uh, then at some point in the rehearsal, Shaka was like, okay, Jeff Lee, come on up, you know, come on. And uh, Jeff got up and plugged in. And, uh, the, the feeling of everything changed. Not that Mike Campbell wasn't super bad, but Jeff Lee had this sort of, you know how people who really have confidence don't need to show you. That was the kind of personality he was. He was, he, he was so confident that he didn't feel the need to show you anything. <laughs> so when you did a to get a glimpse to be inside that man's world for just even a little even a little while was uh, an experience I, I cannot measure in words the value, how much it meant for me to be around him. He had the 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 utmost uh, like. He was so well mannered, so polite, and just like, if it didn't need to be said, don't say it. He was always listening, always knew where he was supposed to be at, you know, uh, like musically, like you just didn't need to tell him anything. Um, and we bonded on that tour. Like, I, he got on the bus one time and I was playing, I think it was There's a Riot going on. And he came in with like his Subway sandwich or whatever. He's like, oh, like just like a baby started. <laughs> and he sat down and we started talking about it. He's like, man, you know. And from there, we were just, I'm, I'm, and in my mind, right away, I was like, we got to play with Sonny. <laughs> I was like, you got to meet this dude named Sonny, man. Yeah, all right, all right. And he said, he said, you used to work for Prince? I said, yeah, man. He said, man. I had a band in Philly uh, that I had just started called The Time. And then The Time came out. I was so mad at Prince, you know, but. Uh, <laughs> Bad timing on The Time, yeah. Yeah, how about that, you know, uh, but, but um, yeah, so we, you know, we, we bonded and then I got hired to do uh, some records that came out on uh Sony France, like the jazz division, uh, with a, uh, a French woodwinds player named Michel Portal. One, one thing I want to say about Jeff Lee, though, before we move on, is uh, I noticed, and I didn't know, that he was born the same month as Prince, which I found interesting. Oh, I, I didn't know that. Yeah, um, uh -huh. June 1958, yeah. Okay, well... That's the, he, equally as prolific, just nobody saw, you know? And uh, I really think that um, <laughs> I would, sometimes I would fly Jeff Lee up to Minneapolis just to get him here to do some recording sessions or sit in with Dr. Mambo's combo and just, because all we played was old soul and funk. Uh, and he knew everything. So he'd just sit in the corner on top of my Fender Deluxe and just funk along. He didn't care if he soloed or not. He just, he was just so cool. His his, uh, play, his playing with, uh, was somewhat unpredictable, which I enjoyed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, unfortunately and fortunately, I, there is a differential between the Jeff that I met and the Jeff that I ended up with because his wife died like the next year. Like he was at home and... His, he had, his wife had just was like, I'm, I'm going to visit my mom, uh, you know, and it was like, I don't know, like a, a 30 minute trip on the, on the freeway. She had a head on collision with a guy who was having a heart attack. Oh, wow. And the state patrol came to his house at like two, three in the morning. It was like, uh, are you Jeffrey Lee Johnson? Yeah. Um, and told him his wife had been in an accident and like his whole world just kind of at that point, you know, and um, I, I feel fortunate that I was around to try to keep an eye on him and keep him busy. Like I, I was the musical director for a French, uh, French, an Italian artist named Georgia. And um, I was just like, listen, I already got the guitar player. I know who I want. So please trust me on this. 
And I was like, I don't need Jeffrey Lee Johnson sitting at his house in Philly having any, I need him where I can see him. I need him with me. That's how I felt about him. I didn't want him to slip out or have anything happen. I, I really felt like I took on the responsibility, not only I, Barbarella also. We took on the responsibility of kind of, as much as we could, taking care of him. You know, I mean, we didn't live in the same state or anything, but it was just like, I I tried to have him around me as often as I could. And he came on that tour and, you know, first rehearsal, Georgia, her mind was blown. She, you know, I mean, but at that point, you know, he was just, he was a shell of a man. He was playing everything from, I said, how do you feel, man? As You know, in rehearsal, he's like, you know what I am now, man? He said, you know anything about planets and stuff? He said, you know how like a dead star, you know, is no longer emitting light, but because of you know, quantum physics or whatever, you still see the shine. Even after it's dead, you still looking at it because of, he's like, that's what I'm doing now. I'm playing from memory almost. It's like, I don't feel anything. I'm dead. I'm dead inside, you know? And uh, really heavy. Yeah, well, I'm telling you, man, I met her one time and they were inseparable, you know, and what it taught me about life is like the bravest thing you can do is really love somebody with your whole heart, you know, because anything can happen. You can be left in any sort of state of disarray, you know, uh, uh, you know, any manner of a, 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 or type of arrested development. Like that was something he... He managed, I don't know, the, I don't, I'm sure he, I'm sure when he died, he was looking for her. He, all he was looking for was to be reunited, mm-hmm. you know, um, but I was happy to have him while I had him, you know, he was, he just, he was devastating. Uh, I remember he was playing with Rochelle Farrell and, uh, <laughs> and Jesse Johnson had just been uh, agreed to go out with D'Angelo. And they called Jeff, since Jeff was in Philly, hey, can you come up for a couple of days and kind of show Jesse the book? Oh, yeah, man. So he took the, I, he liked taking the train. I'm sure he took the train up to New York, went to SIR or whatever, and, you know, plugged in. He knew every went straight down, straight down the show. And, and uh, somebody said, Jesse said, what am I doing here? Why, why don't you just, just take that dude, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and that's saying a lot because Jesse Johnson is also one of the best guitar players I've ever had the chance to work with. And we didn't do much. We just did a a, a, a Hendrix tribute gig at First Avenue, like the year after Prince died. That's as much as my exposure, as that's as much exposure as I really had with Jesse. But, yeah, I, w- I wish he would have done more recording in the past couple decades. Jesse? Yeah. I, 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 yeah, you know, um, I'm sure he does too. <laughs> you know what? I, I don't think it's for a lack of trying, you know? Mm-hmm. I think that it's just the type of music we make, you almost got to be our age to understand it. You know what I mean? Like, if I see a young kid coming up, that plays and sounds like Jesse, you know, it's, <laughs> I ain't looking for that. He'll be bad in a different kind of way, but he ain't going to be bad like Jesse. Jesse is like a real straight blues rock player, man. Like for three days before this gig, it was mostly jamming. We didn't know what we were going to play when we got on stage at first, at first half. Jesse was like, what should we play? And Sonny was like, we jammed so much, we didn't get a repertoire. <laughs> so I started thinking like, oh we, oh, we jammed on this. Yeah, 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 let's play that. So the whole gig was like that. It's like, Jesse was, all day was just murdering it at my rehearsal space. Oh, and, man. We'd love I mean, to have been a fly on the wall for that. Woo! Because he's just like, hey, hey, man, let's take this. Let me take the first day and just loosen up. I ain't played in a while. And it's two, three hours. And just, man, he was vicious. I just. So and also very versatile, he, he like like in like within the blues range, like he's not just like a Hendrix type dude. 
He's also got the, this Robert Johnson type dude. Like, he's very studied. Uh, uh, Jesse is astute. Yeah, I like that blues record he did with Sue Ann Carwell. I mean, yeah. Like, Jesse is, is, is natural. True natural. Just, just great. You know? But so is Jeff Lee. And, and for him to give Jeff Lee that kind of compliment, I'm like, yeah, I know a good, good guitar playing when I hear it. If Jesse said that, then I, I'm right to feel the way I feel about Jeff. I mean, I feel that way anyway, because I know what I'm hearing, you know? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know what to say about him to, to make your listeners go, you know. Well, they better they better get on it if they haven't already. You know, I'm just I, saying. I, I, yeah. mean, I, I mean, I don't even think it's, for my money, the greatest guitar player ever unknown. Jeff Lee Johnson. And let me tell you, let me give you a little tidbit. While he was on tour with us in uh, in Italy, one night, um, I, uh, Georgia, the singer, was having kind of a difficult time. I'm sure it was something, and I don't, I'm not sure if it was what Jeff was playing was agitating her or not. But he was doing what you're supposed to do, and like in the tradition of uh, of soul music, you know, some of it's you know you got to kind of riff an amen behind the singer, like it's you know that's part of it. Jeff played guitar with Aretha Franklin. Jeff played played guitar with uh, Roberta Flack. He knows how to accompany a singer. She's Italian. She ain't never met nobody with that skill set. Not like that. I mean, maybe in a different genre or way or manner, but not in the way that Jeff played. So Jeff just uh, sitting on his amp doing what he normally do. And she comes back to the drum rush and says, I cannot sing with him, you know. Uh, always making these phrases after me, and I, I don't have enough room. I said, I, I said it's cool. I got you. And she walked back, and I looked in Jeff's direction. He just turned his head, and I said, and he just went, and he cut his output like by fifty percent. <laughs> he just adjusted. A pro. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, but more than that, just. I don't know. The, you know, he was. Uh, I just, I just miss him a lot for for many reasons. I miss just talking to him. You know, yeah. watching Training Day on the bus. You know, <laughs> like, oh man, go back to the part with Denzel. You know, oh, I can't come. You know, <laughs> on the tour bus, just watching Training Day and just geeking out over. You know, just different things. You know, he's also uh, just a very stylish dresser. He, uh, we picked him at the uh, picked him up at the airport one day, and he had like, like some old school spats on his shoes, you know, like, 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 uh, like ragtime, you know, like they were. I mean, he just he dressed funky. He was just a funky individual, just in general. Eclectic, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like you can't pin me down. I'm always sharp, and you can never see me coming. It was that sort of thing. Like he was just. The, they the, went to the, the beat of his own drummer, so to speak. You just know? the nicest and the coolest. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for sharing all that. Appreciate yeah, sorry. it. Sorry, uh, you. If if you ask me these things, I get impassioned, man. I, oh, I appreciate I it, man. Start to... <coughs> I hear you, man. I want to be uh, somewhat respectful of time. We've been talking a long time. I so much appreciate it, Michael. Um, I would like to just uh, at least touch on you know what you know you're doing now. If you want to you know share anything that you know you've done recently or you got coming up. Oh wow, man! You know, I, I I've been in uh, Soul Asylum since two thousand five, uh, and that's that's my job. That's what I do. That's that is not my entire musical life now, but that is the 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 staple. You know, if I do anything else, I got to talk to Soul Asylum's management first. I can't just do whatever I want, and I, I don't mind that at all because there's a lot of things. That I'm happy to turn turn down out there. I'm 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 uh, I'm an old man now. I I don't like to. Uh, don't say don't, that. I'm older than you are. So I I don't like to. I, I mean, I'm not a jobber no more. I don't like to run and gun. I don't like staying out till one o'clock in the morning. You know, I don't like none of that. Uh, you know, playing you know three or four sets. You know, four hours. Man, I'm not killing myself for 150 bucks. You know, that's the remarkable thing about the music business, is that. You know, the club managers, they, you know, they think they, they're doing you a favor if you walk out of there with a hundred bucks. I'm like, dude, I was making a hundred bucks a gig in 1986. 
you're not doing nothing for me, man. What ha- what, what you know, it's it- <laughs> and we accept it because we love music so much, we'd make it for free. We don't want anybody to know that. You know, but that's it's still that's man, that's so weak. It, it's 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 not fair. You know, so I guess I just kind of came to the point where like I had enough of it. I'm not going out to some gig. I'm not taking a call, you know, a day before to do some gig that lasts all night and there's been no time for rehearsal. You know, I, I don't know who's on the job. Like I, I don't need that aggravation in my life. I'm a happily married individual. Me and my wife, we can sit together for hours and hardly say a word. And we're just all cool in the gang. And Beautiful. Anytime anybody comes at me, I'm like, hey, listen, I don't need the aggravation. I could be eating, but my wife's Korean. She'll make, uh, (laughs) you know, uh, uh, what is it? Um, Bulgogi sometimes. Like I'll be laying, sitting up in the bed with my lettuce and my pork and my, you know, my kimchi watching House MD with my wife. I'd rather do that than almost anything. Yeah. So you be- if I'm com- if I'm coming to you, you better make it worth my while because I don't. And that's not even a matter of like who I think I am. It's just, you know, I, it, we suffer a lot of indignation for our craft. Right. You've paid your dues. Right. So I'm not I'm not interested in going backwards. And I will tell you also. I mean, other than Soul Asylum, we're working on new material right now. And actually, the last record, which was released in 2021, uh sold uh uh b- better than anything else released since like the mid 90s like the band is on an up upturn like the the output like, there's a resurgence going on it got halted by covid <laughs> cuz we had just started the dead letter tour in february of 2021 and we had to come home like on March 18th <laughs> cuz everybody all the rest of our dates were yeah taken well, you from went us. You, you went later than some to the March 18th yeah uh and and the last gig we played was at um the Terragram Ballroom in California and I only knew what was happening because I overheard the owner talking to his staff saying starting tomorrow we're going down to 50% capacity they say that this this virus is, you know, I just overheard the conversation. We had been on a bus uh, where the internet had been kind of janky and, you know, I, nobody was really watching the news and we were living on a, a, you know, a steel tube, you know, going from city to city. We really didn't know what was happening, uh, like, or to the degree it was happening. We and I have. didn't. Yeah, we could have. Yeah. So we drive to San Diego in the morning and we arrive and get uh, you know an email from the 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 club manager saying the gig is off our entire uh, you know uh schedule is off until further notice and then more emails came that morning just club managers saying yeah, you know your gig's canceled your gig's canceled so the bus turned around and came back to Minneapolis i get off of it and into my wife comes to pick me up in the van i get in the car and she says the first thing you need to know is that you're about to be in quarantine for 12 days. And she just starts into it because she knows I have no idea. I'm looking around. And that just put a, a halt on uh, some really serious momentum we were we were having. Our shows were incredible. They were all sold out. I mean, we were really on the road to just, you know, getting it, man. And uh, that that sacked the rest of the year for us, more or less. We did a couple of streaming events, and uh, then we kind of had to wait it out, you know, until I think the last tour we did, was it this last one in 2022? We went out for about six, seven weeks. Um, uh, last year, no. Uh, uh, wait a minute. 2020 was the year i, I lose track too since the it was 2020 started. that we started we tried to get out and tour for that record and then uh it was last summer was the first time we got to get out since 2020. uh we did about six to seven weeks in uh in the summer and uh a couple more things but um even then we were always hearing about bands that were canceling oh so and so foo fighters 
you know, uh, nope, it's not time yet. You know, all these bands were going home and we were headed out. So it was, you know, it really was an, an ordeal. Like, it, you know, and you really got to see what COVID was doing all around the country, like how it was affecting people. And, you know, some clubs, they, they had uh, mandates and things in place. Others didn't. All we could manage to get control of was what happened backstage. And thanks to our, uh, our tour manager, Janine Anderson, she put together kind of a manifesto, like a writer, and things that we needed to have happen backstage to protect the health of the band. If any of us caught it, you know, cancel Christmas. We would have had to go go home. Right. So we kept a very strenuous routine backstage at, at all our shows. Like if you were around, you had to either uh, have a mask on, you know, proof of that. Maybe it was, it might've been proof of vaccination and a mask. But um, so we just did what, what we could. We had to, we had to, had to, uh, force our will on a lot of these venues and um, just for our own protection. And, uh, but we made it out alive. No, nobody to, uh, to my knowledge, we all left tour without being infected. Wow. Yeah. So now, uh, now you're ramping back up again. Yeah. Well, it's like, well, since we tried to kill ourselves for two years, you know, getting out there, it's like this summer, let's just make it easy on ourselves. And also everybody's headed out this summer. Everybody's going out this summer. So it's like, we don't want to get lost in the shuffle either. So we're happy to take soft ticket dates, festivals, whatnot. You know, there's been a kind of a general resurgence of 90s bands lately. There's a flannel fest is happening in uh, August, I think. You know, and it's even Rolling Stone is talking about that. It's like, really? Y'all care about this little festival? You know? So, you know, things are promising. We're working on new music. But on the gig front, we're taking the easy money right now. <laughs> oh, that sounds like a good plan. Yeah, and, why uh, not? <laughs> yeah. So maybe, maybe, a, maybe a full tour in 2023 if things Could continued. Be. Yeah. But, I mean, we're also, I mean, I've been talking to our booking agent about trying to team up with Living Color in the fall. But uh, I also had an idea a couple days ago that what if we put King's X on the bill also? Ooh. I think because we're trying to put together like a performing arts center type of tour in the fall. You know, we'll see whether or not we can pull it together. But, you know, just like, you know, a few more dignified venues where, you know, all the equipment works and the, you know, the dressing room doesn't smell like urine. And you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I've played my share of, of I've done it. I've <laughs> done it. And I think Dave Perner is probably, <laughs> he's probably anti- you know, uh, you know, anti, um, like, uh, performing arts center. What he's, I mean, he's, he's from the punk tradition. He likes it all, you know, swarthy and basic. I don't, I I'm used to having it better than that. Mm -hmm. So if I can get it better than that, I'm going to have it better than that. You know, as long as he agrees to go along for the ride, hopefully he, he needs me enough to, to see it my way, you know, <laughs> but he don't like those audiences where, they're sitting down and kind of, yeah, all right. You know, where you can't stand up and shoegaze and spill beer on people. That's, that's yeah. his speed. He, he needs the ruffians and, you know, the, you know. <laughs> a, a, a mosh pit or close to it. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it is what it is. The aesthetic calls for it. So the, the, the true hardcore fans, they get, they get cagey and, you know, kind of hostile in some of those nicer venues we play because they demand order. <laughs> you know, no, you can't stand up. Pe pe all these people behind you are trying to see. You know, sometimes they just don't care. They just stand up anyway. You know, and just and take you take the heat. You know, to me, I like the idea of the of the audience being restrained because uh, that's more exciting to me. That you want to do something and you can't. Like, let the excitement build. You know, let's see who can't take it. That's, to me, that's an interesting, you're not social study, but you know dynamic, what I mean? Yeah. yeah, it's a dynamic. It's like, what? Leave, let's have the tension. Why not? You know, but Prince just like, I, and I think Prince was kind of that way too. Um, it, when are polite or forced to be more polite, uh, I think it, it has an effect on, you know, the guy who's driving the ship. Uh, I think that also in Japan, 
Prince tended to be a little bit more hostile anyway, because you know how everything's so regimented. Those people are not allowed to, to just you know loosen up. They might get put in jail, you know. So, you know, we play the Tokyo Dome. And it's you know, people as far as the eye can see, you know, but they're all very, you know, not demure, but and they're, you know, they're listening intently. And but they gotta keep their cool. They gotta be polite. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, Prince is used to ah, you know, <laughs> people falling out and, you know. <laughs> so you think you're not getting over, I think is what it is. You yeah. need to see that people are excited and you know, and that affects the process. I get that. It's a give and take. But then but, in Japan too, they'll sometimes, even though the language barrier, they'll know all the words in English, you know. Yeah, I'll tell you, yeah. Uh, you know what? Uh the first time Soul Asylum went to Peru. We had an experience like that. Dave had an experience like that. Nobody spoke English, but we start playing, and the audience was singing so loud you could hear them the entire night. And I looked like Perna was going to me. It looked like he maybe he's going to cry. Yeah, that's got to be overwhelming. Yeah. So, but can't that's you, it. That's what I'm doing, man. Yeah. Can't, uh, two two quick questions. I hope sure. they're very quick. Okay. One is, is there anybody out there that you would still, on your, like, a bucket list to play with? <laughs> oh, wow. I don't even know if I can answer that right now. I used to have a, have a bucket list, but a lot of those dudes have taken a different direction in music. People like Sting or Peter Gabriel or, like, they doing, they're not doing what I would want would have wanted to be doing with them. Hmm. So... You know, I suppose, I mean, also, you know, I mean, I don't need to tell you. I've seen the mountaintop. It's hard to, to, <laughs> it's hard to live with the reality that I'll never be able to work with somebody as great as Prince. Again, he's, that type of person cannot be made in, in, in these times. The, the industry won't allow it. Nobody's ever going to get that type of freedom again. You know, and nobody's ever going to fight for their freedom that hard again. You know, the whole model has changed. Um, and I think that has an effect on the artistic output. I I mean, really, it's um, it's <laughs> it's a reality I live with. You know, <laughs> I can't even I mean, I would love to, you know, work with some people, but some of them got great drummers already, like. Chrissy Hyde, you know. Um, well, I don't mean long term. Maybe just you know one performance, you know, one song or oh, whatever. Uh, I don't know. I'd still like for me and Sonny to jam with Herbie. I that's one thing I would love to do is jam with Sonny and Herbie Hancock at the same time. That would be some insanity. But I mean, I cut a record with George Benson, man. I I I, saw I, that, yeah. I have an I, it's an embarrassment of riches. Music is my life, I, I, and I, I couldn't imagine it any other way. I have come into such close contact with all of the people I aspired to work with, well, pretty much almost everybody. You know, the two that got away were Steely Dan. I, they, they called asking about uh, if I could make a recording date one time. But I think either the date changed or their plans changed, and then I was off the hook. I didn't get to work with, you know, with uh with them and now that um is his name randy walter becker walter i always got his first name wrong. yeah now that walter's gone it's like it, they, even that wouldn't be the same if donald fagan called tomorrow you know uh so i i missed that and um and i actually uh i had one more in mind but that's one example it just it, it was a missed opportunity that I, and it was just a recording session. They weren't talking, you know, anything long, long term. They just wanted, you know, to cut. Um, but other than that, I can't think of another right now. All right. The other, this last one, um, you're probably going to be mad at me to ask, but uh, can you single out two to three uh, Prince tracks that you were involved in that are just your favorite or you're most proud of? Um, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm probably most proud of Diamonds and Pearls because that's that was the first time I got to cut with him and 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 other people. 
Before that, any recording I did with Prince, it was just me and him. Like Elisa Fiorillo's record, I Am. There's two songs on it. One's called Ooh, This I Need, and the other one's called Love's No Fun. I cut both of those in like an hour with Prince in Studio A, and it was just me and him. He just played piano, and we, you know, tracked. And then he went in the control room, and I followed him, and I watched him <laughs> lay down all the other tracks while holding a conversation with me. It was like it was like it was like a fish drinking water. Like he, it was like he just easily did both. Like he already knew what he was. It was like he just it was all in his head, and he was just going through the motions while we're talking about you know <laughs> whatever. So day in the office, yeah, yeah, and really it was just he was. Just it was like this is what I do, and our first few experiences were like that. It wasn't until that fateful day that Tommy and Sonny were there that we get got to record in a more ensemble sort of. And to me, Diamonds and Pearls is like that. That was that's the uh, the flagship track for me. That's the one everybody wanted to know about, and I think it's the one I'm most proud of because Prince asked me. He didn't. He he he. It demanded. Uh, uh, you know, uh, an order, or, or it demanded a, an effort uh, in a spontaneous moment. Like, I really needed to, I knew that that moment that he gave me when he said, oh, put some kind of fill in there in that bar. In the, I knew, that, I knew that whatever I played was going to follow me for the rest of my life. So, <clears throat> and I could have played it a lot safer, but I really, I took the risk. And it was all reward after. So, you know, I'd say uh, like shush, like there's a lot of them that just, you know, mm. prodigious where he gave me a lot of room. And I'm not that type of drummer, really. I'm not really that ex explosive. Uh, like I'm not a soloist. I like to play music. You know, like what you know, which uh, uh, brings to mind for me or brought to mind for me and still does was I want to be free by the how players the way diamond did, <laughs> you know, it's, Dennis Chambers uh, you know, told somebody, uh, uh, apparently, and it got back to me. He's like, Dennis, man, Dennis really digs your drumming, man. He's like, he's like, you the new Diamond. I said, and I never thought to myself, I don't sound like Diamond, you know. And then I realized, no, there's a definite link. I grew up listening to the Ohio players, but Diamond got in there, I, I through osmosis or something. I didn't put plan it on sounding like him. I kind of thought he was, you know, I didn't understand funk, you know, like I do now. I didn't know why he had to play so sloppy. You know, actually, until I met Mike Campbell, and he was like, man, because <laughs> I did a, it was like a black and white ball in San Francisco with Shaka. And Ohio players went on before Shaka. And uh, so I was like standing next to, the, uh, next to the stage with Shaka. And she, you know, she was like, come on, let me hit, come on, Sugarfoot. You know, she was hollering at him, you know. And she, and she said something about the drummer, but Mike Campbell came up after the set and said, man, Diamond's playing too tight. He's been practicing or something. I don't like it. I don't like it. <laughs> you know, like Diamond was mashing it, but he had got, become a lot more precise. Hmm. And, and Mike Campbell just, he, he didn't care for that. <laughs> you can't win, right? Somebody's going to say this, somebody's going to say that. That's exactly it. Oh, yeah. and can I leave you with one little tidbit? Because I forgot to dovetail on this. Uh, when a Prince was talking to me about, like, I don't know a hit. I don't know what people are, you know, uh, expecting of me. I don't know what they want. You know, he said, what do I know from a hit? He said, Terry and Jimmy sent me an advanced copy of Control. He said, I listened to it once, and I took it out of the player, and I threw the CD right in the garbage can. <laughs> he said, <laughs> he said, Every time I heard a single from that record come on the radio, all I could hear was the sound of that garbage can. He said, I don't know a hit. I don't know what makes a hit. I'm just doing what I know. Thank you so much, Michael. It's been great getting to know you better, man. Well, I, to, 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 yeah, well, to be around me is to know me. I'm, I don't put on any ears. I'm just who I am. I'm, just a, you know, <laughs> I'm a simple person try, trying, to, trying to do what I believe God placed me here to do, man. So thank yeah. you so much for, for – uh, I mean, and I kind of, I, I bullied my, I uh, gorilla pimp my way onto your show. I got in touch with you. Hey, put me on, man. You know, yeah. 
and I well, guess that, the, and that's the man knows I, what he wants when he wants. Yeah. Well, I I know uh, I know a strong interview when when I see it. So you've got the goods, man. That's why I came to you. Thank you, thank okay, you, thank you so that. much. Okay. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Truth and Rhythm. A big thank you goes out to our guest as well as to you, the viewer and listener. Also, much gratitude to Pleasure for supplying the show's funky opening and closing music. As a reminder, you can always access the complete list of linked shows by episode at funkinstuff.net. I urge you to support this program and receive the extra benefits along with that by subscribing to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube and sharing it with funk, R&B, and jazz lovers, joining Truth and Rhythm's membership program at Patreon, submitting a donation at funkandstuff.net, buying Everything is on the One, the first guide to funk book at Amazon, shopping at the Funky Things store for cool merchandise at funkandstuff.net, and linking through funkandstuff.net for all of your Amazon purchases. In addition, if you're an artist or anyone seeking proven, results-oriented, professional marketing, PR, writing, or editing consultation or production, check out the media services section at funkinstuff.net. Also, I encourage you to drop me a line at scottg at funkinstuff.net. I love the feedback, suggestions, guest requests, appearance and sponsorship inquiries, and just talking about my favorite subject, groove-based music. For now, and as always, this is Scott Dr. GX Qualfine saying, keep on keep vibing on to the rhythm of the one.